Awesome. Okay, so um, we just want to give a brief overview of Lunar Project before we begin for those who might be a little bit newer to us. Um, so Lunar Project is an Asian American solidarity funding initiative that is supporting the movements for Black and Indigenous lives. Uh, we launched last month with a giving circle for Asian American women and gender nonconforming folks, um, some of whom are on this Zoom with us today. Uh, who are each pooling and redistributing resources towards Black and Indigenous-led organizations, businesses, and community development projects that are advancing community self-determination and racial justice. So why giving circles? Um, we are really excited about and want to build off the rich history of giving circles in general that have existed many, many generations before us many of which the first instances in the US at least emerged out of a need within benevolent societies and other mutual aid organizations for early immigrants that came and did not have any institutional support, especially any ties to financial systems in the US. And so pooled money together to support each other's businesses, support each other's well-being and, and, and lives. And so we are building on that specific legacy in the circle of the Lunar Project. Um, and so, our members, as they all are very well aware of and are in the thick of, are participating in a 12-week political education curriculum right now that's focused on Asian American history, better understanding our community's relationship to racism, exploring the idea of solidarity and different funding models that are um, thought of as solidarity funding and within a solidarity economy. And so for us, our ultimate goal really is to build cross-cultural racial solidarity with Black and Indigenous communities and organizations and leaders, et cetera, that we hope to pool and fund through the $100,000 that our Giving Circle members have pulled together. Um, and so at the end of the 12 weeks, the Giving Circle members collectively flow out this money and we are co-designing together a participatory process. So for us, our vision really is to use our 12 week giving circles to help us prototype and think through, well, what if it wasn't $100,000, but it was $20 million, $50 million, $100 million. How would that money be used for solidarity between Asian and Black and Indigenous communities? And so it's always been our intention really um, to build out a community beyond uh, our circle members because we are really excited about sharing this work with everyone in the Asian American community and beyond and really anyone who is interested in the concept of solidarity and also are trying to figure out a way to practice it and move from idea to thought. And so Today kicks off our first webinar series um, that we invite the broader Lunar Project community in. And for those of you that joined recently, um, I was sharing at the beginning that we are super excited about this. Please share with your friends and family and other individuals in your circles at work or whatnot um, that you think would be interested in any of these conversations. There will be many more that roll out in the coming weeks. And so we have a Google Doc where you can see what the schedule looks like and it is emerging. We also invite you to suggest speakers to us as well. Awesome. Um, so without further ado, I just want to I want to turn it over to our guest speaker today, Donna Chris John, who will be sharing about the Indigenous experience from an Indigenous perspective. Um, and we'll have a little time for Q&A at the end. So please type your questions into the chat throughout the presentation, and we'll try to answer as many of them as we can. So welcome, Donna. Hi. Ha matakiapi, Donna Krishani, Machiapi, Kisto, Rosebud, Amatahan, Naleha, Inglewood, Awatiha, Iyuha, Chante, Awashtena, Bay Chizapi. Hi, everyone. My name is Donna Christian, And um, what I said in my language is I greet you with a warm heart. And I also said um, where I'm from, that I'm from Rosebud, but I currently live in, in Denver. Um, or I might have said Inglewood, sorry, because <laughs> we just moved. But anyways, um, this is where I'm from, and um, that's that's our language. And um, I am Sija Angu Lakota and Dana. So uh, I'm going to share my screen. Can we can we see it? Yeah, I can't see it. Can you guys see that? We 
we see a black screen that just says Donna has started sh screen sharing. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> Hold on. Let's try again. No. Oh, now now we see it. Okay. Right. Okay, so this is my language. I've seen the presenter view though. That's, oh. It's like showing the, the, like what's showing now in the next slide preview. How do I turn that off? Display settings. There. Yay. Are we good? Looks great. Looks great. Okay. So this is what I just said written out in our language. And I provide this slide so that you understand that we do have our languages written and that we do have um, dictionaries and grammar books um, today. So this is how it looks written out. And yeah. Um, I am Donna Christian. My pronouns are we, are, she, her, hers. Um, I am a mother or Ina in Lakota. I am an advocate, I am a consultant, and I'm a paralegal. So first and foremost, I, I say I'm a mother. It's the most important role that I have in my life. Um, I'm the mother of five children. My oldest daughter is 28, and my youngest daughter is 11. I have three boys in the middle. So, and yes, I'm that old. And no, I didn't have her when I was 14. <laughs> So, um, but uh, I, I lean on that so much because it gives me great perspective in life. And um, for, for me as a Lakota woman, uh, which is we are, it is the most important role in our community is to raise our children. Um, I'm an advocate. I'm an advocate for, I, I call myself a community advocate, not necessarily community in terms of Lakota. I believe that I'm a community advocate for the community I'm a part of. So I live in the Denver metro area. Um, I'm a Denver native and I was born here. Um, and I contribute back to my community in every way that I can in lending um, both my indigenous voice, my parent voice, um, my woman voice, um, as much as I can, um, I, I do try to do that and contribute back. Um, I'm a consultant. I've been doing Indigenous education consultant work for 43 years. So I started doing that work when I was five years old with my mom in the state of Nebraska. So we moved there when I was three, and my mom started presenting to schools and organizations in 1977. So, um, and I've just continued to do that throughout my life. The goal then quickly turned toward changing curriculum in schools with my mom. And, um, and we continue to do that, to, to make that effort to introduce books, to introduce different curriculums to educators and administrators in order to push that effort. Um, I believe that education is key to making this change, not only for Native people, but for non-Native people um, throughout the country. Um, I'm also a paralegal and I've been in the legal industry for 25 years. Uh, who am I? So I said these terms, I said I'm Sichangu and Deneth. Um, those are my two tribal flags at the bottom. And I put those there so that we have an understanding that we are considered tribal nations. And we do have flags, we have a government, we have presidents, vice presidents. Um, we receive federal funding to provide programming for our communities. So the colonized terms are what is displayed on our flags. So I am the Rosebud, I am from Rosebud Sioux Tribe out of Rosebud, South Dakota, and I am also Navajo. So how many of you have heard of Sioux or Navajo as opposed to Sijangu and Dineth? Like everyone, right? 
Yeah, the more the more common terms for us are the colonized terms of Sioux and Navajo. But in in my language, I am Sijangu, and in Dene we are Dene. So Sijangu means the burnt by people, and. I put this picture of the grass because in the Great Plains region, we have grass that grows over our, the tops of our heads. So a long time ago, um, some of our enemies or somebody who we weren't getting along with at that time decided to burn our encampment. So we had to run to our next door neighbors, which are probably 20 miles away. And by the time we got there, we were burnt all the way up to our thighs. So we were then named the burnt thigh people. And as long as I have known, or at least for the last nine, 10 generations of women, we have been called the, the burnt thigh people or Sijangu. So this is the name or the term of who we are and how I identify as a Lakota person. So who am I? How many of you have heard of these terms? Everybody has probably heard these, right? Indian, American Indian, Native American, Aboriginal, First Nations, and Sioux and Navajo. So Indian comes from the man who was lost. Um, in my house growing up, my mother um, said that that name was a dirty word in her house. So we weren't allowed to say Christopher Columbus. <laughs> growing up in my household. Um, funny, not funny, but my mom was serious about it. We were not allowed to say his name. So um, the term Indian came from, from him thinking he was traveling to the West Indies. So he called us Indian. Then over time, they decided after America was established, they called us American Indians to distinguish us from Indians from India or from the West Indies. So Two terms, not derogatory, just incorrect. Then we have the term Native American. This came about by Act of Congress in 1984. Um, that at that time, there were uh, Indian people who were then born in America. So they had to have a racial category for American born Indians. And then what would they call us? So they came up with a new term and they called, it, called us Native Americans. All three of these terms, we were not consulted, we were not asked, they were forced upon us. We were told these are the terms that we are giving you, regardless of what you call yourselves, what your names are for yourselves. Um, these are the umbrella terms that, that were forced upon us over 500 years ago. So Indian American, Indian and Native American. I throw in Aboriginal and First Nations because these are out of Canada. Um, and we don't recognize these borders. So Aboriginal is a term that does come from, from Canada and is listed in their books um, and their, their federal policies or their governmental policies. Um, this term is also widely used um, in Australia and New Zealand. And then we have First Nations. I particularly like this term, um, but that is something that the Canadians call themselves as well. And then we have the breakdown of Sioux and Navajo and the separate tribal nations. So Sioux is actually not a word, it's an enclitic. It's the ending of a, of a word. Um, if you've ever heard from a Boy Scout or, or a Girl Scout program, they'll tell you that Sioux means friend or ally. Um, it actually doesn't mean anything at all. It has no meaning. The beginning of the, the word comes from uh, an Anishinaabe term. So when the fur traders were coming across the Great Lakes region, they encountered the Anishinaabe or Ojibwe or um, Chippewa nation first. And we don't always get along with them. So they had a term for us and it was called snake in the grass. And that term is Natawisi in their language. So over time, the French fur traders pluralized that and added an O-U-X to the end. And it was Natawisu. Well, I guess it just became too cumbersome to write out the whole term Natawisu. <laughs> so they just dropped the front part and left, left it as Sioux, which like I said, means nothing. It's an enclitic. And Navajo comes from a Pueblo um, or Tewa term meaning horse thief. So none of these terms 
well, I guess horse thief is derogatory, right? But just incorrect. All of them are incorrect. None of them have a sense of pride for me as a Lakota woman. Um, I grew up with my mother, with my grandmother telling me where Sijangu came from, where Lakota comes from, and this is who I am. So I know nine generations, I can go back. My, my mother was Sichang, or is Sichangu, my grandmother, her mother, her mother, like I said, I can go back nine generations of Sichangu women. That is who I am. And it would be a dishonor if I called myself anything else than Sichangu. And I have to honor where I come from and who I am. So I am not Sioux and I am not Navajo. I am Sijangu and Dana. Those are my tribal nations. So, and then why is identity important? Right? We went through this, this whole thing of going through these identifying terms, how I identify as Lakota woman. So the first screenshot is of the term Native American. So I pulled this from Google. I, don't, I think this is from two weeks ago, and this is my Google shot. You can see my little picture in the upper right corner. Um, that, that's what comes up when I Google. You can do this live right now if you, if you feel, right? Pull up the term. And then I also do a, did a screenshot of American Indian. So if anybody wants to chime in, what do you see familiar in both of these screenshots? What's, what do you see? A lot of old pictures. Right. Anybody else? The headdress? Yep. A lot of headdresses. Stereotypes. Yeah. Stereotypes. Yep. Why do you think that there's old pictures? What do you what do you think about that? About the old pictures or black and white pictures, right? Why do you think that is? Why do you think that out of both of these pictures we're showing there's there's mostly gray or black and white pictures, mostly men and mostly feathers. So, why do you think that is? What do you think Google's trying to tell you? There's a lot of erasure there, right? So it's like, oh, these were folks who lived on this continent in the past, but there's nothing current. Exactly. That's exactly it. It's erasure. We're supposed to be dead. We only exist in the past. We don't get to move into the future. These are current screenshots from Google. They want you to think we're dead. We no longer exist. That's pretty sad, right? In, this, in these Google shots, there's not very many pictures, contemporary pictures of, let's say me, right? So how would you know if you're meeting or talking to another indigenous person? If, if this is what you're seeing when you Google, right? When you take it, when you look us up or you try to find out any information about us, you're gonna see old time pictures, pictures from the past, stereotypes of us wearing headdresses. I mean, I don't walk around with a headdress every day. <laughs> I think that that's pretty, pretty outrageous. It's pretty cool if I could, but I, I don't. So, um, yeah. So we're gonna move forward. I did some other screenshots. So I did screenshots of Latino. Look at that. They get to be in contemporary life, right? They get to be in the here now. Look at African-American. Again, contemporary. And Asian-Americans, also contemporary. So this is very purposeful and intentional that this is the first page that you see. So 
I know it's controversial to think that the government controls Google, <laughs> but I think we're all well aware of the control of our, of our government and their lens. So I think it's fair enough to assume that this is con a controlled viewpoint of who we are. So we go back to these identifying terms and where I come from. You can imagine for 500 years feeling like I don't get to identify with who I am. And even today, when I Google myself I, or those terms, I'm only looked at from the past as a relic, as something that's dead and gone or a stereotype of who I am. I don't ever get to show up as myself. How do you think that that makes us feel as Indigenous people? It makes us sad, right? Sad, angry, disappointed, um, all of that, right? Like, how can we how can we make this change? What do we need to do? How do we how do we change this perspective? How do we get somebody to, to listen to us, to hear us, to see us for who we are? Because it's important. If you can imagine, and I know that with, with different cultures and different people, we all are one step away from somebody who just came over to the United States and, and is here now. Like whether your parents are first generation or your grandparents or even yourself. Can you imagine being told that you're not who you say you are the second you come over here? Oh, you're not German. We're going to give you another name and you're not going to be able to speak your language. You're not going to be able to dress the way you want to. You're not going to be able to say who you really are. You're, you're this to us now. This is your name. This is where you come from and you're going to speak English. So our experience has been from day one with colonization, complete erasure, complete harm, complete genocide. And, and those identifiers were, were stripped of us and tried, they tried really hard to take that away from us. So for me, I am a proud Sijangu woman and it is honor, with honor that I'm able to carry that term, speak my language, know where I'm from, know that I can go back to where my ancestors are. My, my mother told me this all the time growing up always be proud of who you are and where you come from. People want that. They long for that. They want to go home to pray where their people prayed, to, to see the things that their people did. And we live right here. We live where our people are from. So you be proud of that. And you remember that always, that your ancestors are with you on your land. So how many nations are in the United States? Does anyone know? Trick question. <laughs> no guesses this is a fun part anybody can guess <laughs> no no guesses 100 500. One. Oh, 50 plus 350 200 that's about halfway we have 573 federally recognized tribal nations in the United States, 54 state recognized tribal nations, and 634 First Nations in Canada. So between the two countries, there are 1,261 total nations in the US and Canada combined. Mind blowing. Are you mind blown? That's pretty huge. Right? When you think about that, you're like, whoa, first off, I'm, I'm in the US. This is one nation, right? When I ask kids that question, they're always like, what? There's only one nation. This is the US. No, we have 627 nations in the United States recognized by the federal government. So these are, these are definitions established by the US government and then by state governments. To, to give us an identity and to give us nationhood. So there's actually double this amount of tribal nations in the US because we can't all be recognized according to these federal and state definitions. 
So <clears throat> there were estimated to five, 50 to 100 million people, indigenous people before contact. Now, according to the 2010 census, 4.5 million in the US and 1.8 million in Canada. So normally when I ask this question, I do a lot of work with schools. So I'll ask a school room or uh, a room of teachers, how many of you have ever identified or heard that you have indigenous heritage or ancestry in your family? Um, that number sits around 25%. So I've been doing this for 43 years. So you can imagine every single classroom that I have taken that data from, we sit around 25% of the population. So according to the US Census Bureau, we're less than 1%. I disagree. I think we're right around that 20%, between 15 and 20% of the, of the entire population of the United States. So that's a significant jump. And there's a reason for that. There's distrust in the government, right? So go back to the Google page, there's distrust in the government and our imagery. So we don't wanna participate in government programs or government collection of data. Um, and that is the Census Bureau. The, the first time I've ever participated was this last year in 2020. I have never given my data to the US Census until 2020. So I'm definitely one of those that does not believe in, in lending my information. So here in Colorado, cause that's where I'm at, we have 47 tribes that historically call Colorado home. That's big, right? 47 tribal nations have lived in Colorado historically and, and still would like to call Colorado home. That's the entire Great Plains region. There were so many of us that came to this area for the same reason people come here now, for the water, for the outdoor industry, for the good weather, um, for the mountains, to go up in the mountains. And then if there's water and good land, there's going to be good, good hunting, so the animals are gonna come down from the mountains and, and eat from the fertile land. So then there's good hunting and we can be, live a sustainable livelihood. So there were a lot of tribal nations that would come here for trading and also for matchmaking to meet your, um, your significant other, other and hopefully marry um, because we can't stay with our own family forever. We have to look outside our family to marry. So that was a huge part of the Colorado region. So whose land are you on? And I'm so glad that Sabrina walked you through that exercise to begin with, to, to have you guys think about that, look at what your current community is doing, who lives on your land and what are they up to, right? So this is a website that you can go to. It's a Canadian website, but you can access it. They also have an app you can download on your phone. And if you type in any zip code, it'll tell you whose land you're on and it'll give you their um, their name in their own language. And sometimes they'll give you information about, um, whatever area you're in. So let's say if you're on Mount, Mount Evans, which is the name of Mount Evans right now, but they're going to change that. If I was standing on top of Mount Evans, they would tell me the, the Cheyenne or Arapaho term for Mount Evans, if somebody um, put that information in there. So it's really a fun app and a fun um, website to go to, to be able to at any time look up whose land am I on and be able to, to know that information at any time. So I encourage you to do that. So we have three termination acts. So back to this governmental policy, right? So we have three termination acts in the United States. The first one is just simply to get rid of us, right? Terminate us, commit genocide. This was done by and through Buffalo, killing our Buffalo, and then by and through killing us and creating bounties for, for our bodies. So all of us have heard of the, the team, the Washington team and the R word. So that term came about from the bounties. So it was posted in um, newspapers that you would receive a certain amount of money for a man, woman, or child. And it depended on um, which one you brought in, how much money you would receive. And they called, the way that they did this, I know everybody heard of the term scalping, but they didn't actually scalp us. They took our entire bodies. They skinned us and they took our genitalia in order to determine man, woman, and child. And they presented these 
red bloody skins to get paid for killing us. So that's where that term comes from. So you can imagine over time why that, that teen name is so harmful and why it carries so much hurt and harm for indigenous people, why we were asking for the name change. We were asking for the change of that name for over 50 years. So I just, it's really, that's a, that's a hard felt moment, right? To, to learn that information and to know that. And those skins were housed in the National Archives until 1994. Um, because they were seen as a form of receipt for payment. So the, the U.S. government <laughs> kept them in, not funny, not funny, I have a nervous giggle, sorry. Um, funny, not funny, um, held in the National Archives until 1994. Um, and then they invited Indigenous leaders from across the country to come and um, sort through them and take them home and pray, for, pray over them and send them back. So um, true story. Um, the second one is to take our children. So I'm sure you've heard in the headline news about um, the boarding schools and all the bodies that are now being found underneath boarding schools, both in Canada and the US. And if you haven't heard of that, they've uncovered over, I think it's over 3000 at this time. Oh, I'm sorry, my husband corrected me. It's close to 6,000. Um, so this, uh, policy is arguably still in effect today. Um, I would say that they were actively taking children from homes through the 1990s. The last boarding school, um, residential school was closed in 1996. So they were actively taking children from our homes until 1996. So from the 1800s to 1996, with the full intention of assimilating our children. So the motto was kill, kill the Indian, save the man. So we were supposed to come out of there without language, without culture, and just be assimilated to white culture. So policy number one, policy number two. And the third one is the enrollment policy, which is still in effect today. This is a blood quantum policy. How many of you know exactly how much you are, where you're from, where, you're, where your family's from? Do you know exactly percentage or blood quantum level, fractions? Anyone? Do you know exactly? Half and half? 100 percenters? <laughs> So I am one eighth French, I am three eighths Lakota, and I'm one half Dene. If I am to check the box that says I am American Indian or Native American, I have to be able to prove it. I can't just say that and, and not have a card or a certificate degree of Indian blood on me at that time. So if I fill out a uh, employment application and I check that box, they can ask for verification. If I fill out a scholarship uh, application or school application, I have to be able to provide proof at any time. And so do my children. So that enrollment policy is still in effect today. And it was meant to be, at the time that this was enacted, we were on reservation land, which was fenced in. My mom calls them POW camps because at that time we were not allowed to leave. So we were fenced in these areas. They developed this enrollment policy because they figured we couldn't marry our cousins forever. We would have to eventually marry white people or non-native people off the reservation. So if we can't kill them, we can't take their children, we're going to get rid of them on paper. So that's what that policy is. So three termination policies to get rid of us. <clears throat> This picture is a buffalo skulls. So it just, it's just a demonstration of how active they were in trying to, to kill our food source and what the buffalo meant to us. These are all buffalo skulls. And um, this was what Colonel Dodge said in 1867, every buffalo dead is an Indian gone. So we are still here despite all of that. 
I'm still here. My children are still here. I am almost 100% native. I've read that one, one little bit, that one eighth French, right? <laughs> but by all counts of history, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not supposed to be alive. And I'm certainly not supposed to be almost 100%. So it was a very active movement over the years to get rid of us. Why? Can anyone say why? For land, for our resources. And now the other two policies of blood quantum and taking our children away was, was erasure. If we, if we get rid of that, we don't have to answer to the genocide. We don't have to answer to the policies that we put in place. If we continue to erase them, if we continue to ignore that that was an issue or that we did all of that, then we can, can continue to hold this land. We can continue to reap its resources and take from the indigenous people. So it, it was a, it's a very active act of genocide. And you, could, you can still say today that that is happening through land, through education, through employment, through reservations, that they are still currently trying to get rid of us. Through your Google search, they are trying to erase us. So I am still here, my beautiful family is still here, and we are going to fight. So this is my family, this is my husband, this is our middle son, I have two older, but this is our middle son, this is an older picture, but it's so cute. And then um, the little guy, <laughs> he looks so painful, he was sick that day, and then our baby girl. So this is a couple of years ago, but this should be a Google image, right? This is, this should be who you see when you Google us is that we're real people. We go to work just like everyone else. We drive cars, we go to school, our kids are in your classrooms. I mean, we're, we do all the things we dye our hair blonde. <laughs> we do, we do all the things that are, that are fun, that are part of American culture that, but we're, we're also still very much in touch and a part of our own culture. So it is possible that we have been able to bridge these two worlds and live in, in two separate worlds and balance that. So I say I live in one world and I have two places I can go at all times. I can be both at the same time. So yeah, this is my family. So languages, it was estimated there were over 2,000 different languages spoken in North America before contact. Today, according to the US Census Bureau, there are 169 different languages. When I attended the, um, oh, what is it? It's a language institute. They estimated there were over 350 languages um, spoken in the United States today. So. I think it's amazing. There are 350 ways to say shoe. There are 350 ways to say, I love you that originate from this land, from the U S and that's amazing. My, my husband's mom will not allow us to say, I love you or hello in English. When we see her, we have to say it in Oneida when we see her. So that's the first thing we have to say. We have to say Sagoli and Gomalumpa in her language, or she doesn't, she doesn't think she's like, why are you saying it to me in English? I don't understand that. <laughs> she's like, it means nothing to me. So she wants to hear it in her language. So she knows it means something to her. So here are some organizations. And I did this in Denver because it's local to me, but I also want to point out that Denver was considered a relocation city in the 1950s. So a lot of organizations are here in the Denver metro area, just like I know there are a ton of organizations in the San Francisco area as well. So NARF is here, American Indian College Fund, AIM was started here, First Nations Development Institute, the Indian Center, ACES, Native American Bank, uh, just a, a slew of organizations. So we are a hub. Denver is considered a hub for Indian country. 
Um, I currently sit on the Denver American Indian Commission. Um, I was a former co-chair. I served in co-chair position for two years. So we, we created um, an economic impo impact report in 2015. And this impact report is available online if you're curious. I don't know of anyone else who's done this for their state, but we contributed 1.5 billion um, back to Colorado's economy um, up, up until 2015. So with native owned businesses, nonprofits, public colleges and universities, tribal nations and events. That's where we, we um, disseminated this information and, and received this from, so this data. So I think that's pretty cool to look at that and, and to know that that exists. Um, the Denver American Indian Commission, these are some of the things we're involved with. So this last year, or just this like three months ago, we passed the elimination of native mascots in public schools. Um, we also have an indigenous resource guide and we recreated a renaming committee to review public assets here in Denver. Um, so support native businesses and support native artists. Here's a group of national organizations that I put together. There's Natives in Philanthropy and they have a long list of places that you can donate to and that they themselves collect funding for to, to um, give out to organizations. Um, Unity is a youth organization. They are national and they hold a national conference. Indian Collective is amazing out of um, South Dakota. They're new. I think they founded maybe five years ago by Nick Tilson. Um, pretty, pretty active in the community. They speak to a lot of different areas. So I encourage you to look them up. I sit on the Chinook Fund Board of Directors currently at this time, and I am um, the incoming co-chair. And we do a lot of collective um, efforts for Black liberation and Indigenous sovereignty. So we work with um, communities and organizations that are doing community organizing to help um, persons of color to give back to their community. So that's that's what we do funding for. And it's kind of grassroots. Um, I encourage you to go to the website and learn a little bit more. Um, AIM is here and that's a national um, organization. They are also located around the country. We have a chapter here in Denver. There's one in San Francisco, Cleveland. I mean, they're scattered throughout the United States. Any pipeline effort that you have going on, currently we're trying to stop line three going through Anishinaabe country, which is out of Minnesota. Um, so that's Anishinaabe, but it's also Lakota, Dakota, Nakota territory and Menominee. Um, there are several different tribal nations up in that area that are fighting this line. So if you go on Instagram, you can search for line three, and there are many organizations that you can lend to and give to, but I, I 100% support that just as I supported Standing Rock. Um, the water and the land issues are an us is issue. It is not about indigenous land. This is about everyone's land and everyone's water. And if we are not taking care of it, we will not have any water in the US. So this is not about just indigenous country. We just happen to be on the front lines fighting for it. So I encourage you to, to look at that and and to support those efforts. Um, there are American Indian commissions across the United States in every city or in, at least in every state. So you can look into those and look into the, the issues that they are facing and support those as well. Sometimes it's just community organizing. They want people to come and support their efforts or share what's happening in their community. Um, Illuminative, is a national organization that is helping to change the narrative and pushing out educational efforts. Um, and then the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Relatives, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Plus. Um, there are data collections going on about this in Sovereign Bodies Institute, the Urban Health Institute out of Seattle. So you can contribute to either one of those. Um, I didn't touch base on a lot of that. I'm sure I'm gonna get questions, which is fine. I, I will speak to that because it, it hits home for every woman um, what, what that um, 
what that effort is and what we're trying to do in our communities. So um, the last one is my own company, <laughs> Eon Consulting, and I do educational work, like I said, and I'm trying to change curriculum in schools. So I'm developing um, currently uh, toolkits here in the state of Colorado because we passed an initiative about teaching indigenous education in schools. So I am working on that currently at this time. So, and that's, oh, my next page is about um, native artists. So please look these up. Please support um, artists that are selling goods from coffee cups to hats, to sweatshirts, to earrings, necklaces. Um, it's phenomenal. So I encourage you, it is not appropriation to buy indigenous made goods. Um, just not headdresses <laughs> and of the like. So, and that's all I have. If you have questions. Thank you, Donna. It would be so awesome if you wanted to send us the presentation and we can copy down the organizations you shared and share it with the group. Um, I know we don't have too much time left, but I, I really <laughs> did want to open the floor up for any q and A. I have I have some questions prepared, but really want the group to be able to share any reflections. I just want to thank you, Donna. That was really great. Um, I, I mean, there's a lot that I knew, but there's a lot that I learned as well. So I really appreciate that. I guess um, a question that I have was in sort of the list of names like Indian and American Indian and Native American, one of the names that I noticed that wasn't there was indigenous. And so I'm just curious about um, anything you might have to say about that term. Yeah, um, I didn't list the ones that I prefer um, in terms of umbrella group terms. Um, I, I do like indigenous, native and um, First Nations. But um, if you get 25 of us in the room, you're going to get 25 different answers. And we're all going to say that we, we like a different term better than, than another. So um, what, what I prefer before we get to umbrella terms is just simply if somebody asks me, what is your tribal nation? And like over the moon excitement when I hear that, like, woo, we got it right. I'm a Kota and Dene. So, but, um, and then, you know, go from there in that conversation. So, um, like I said, the, those terms are not derogatory. So it's not a, a dirty word or something like that. They're just wrong. That, that's all just historically and placement location wrong. Um, it would be great to hear so at some other point, like if you want to, if you're going to send us some stuff about like the work that you're doing and changing curriculum, that yeah. because like, I think a lot of us kind of, you know, we went to schools where they told, you know, they told things that were not true and also completely inconsistent to the point where like kids don't even know what's going on. It's like, you tell us one thing and then you tell us a different thing. And the two things are not the same thing. Right. right. Um, and probably neither is the truth. <laughs> yeah. I can definitely um, send information and um, I'll send you a list of, of states that actually have their listed curriculums um, that have already done that work that um, you can look at that that's that's already been like Montana, Washington, Oregon, uh, Arizona, Nebraska, Minnesota, um, they've all implemented uh, curriculum change. Um, of course, it's an ongoing effort. Not everything's perfect, but definitely started that process of making those changes. So um, the the reason why I do that presentation and why I did that presentation with you tonight is that's the same thing I would present to a fourth grade classroom. So welcome to fourth grade, everyone. <laughs> but but it's also meant to, to illustrate and demonstrate how much information is lacking in schools and how important it is to hear that because it changes the perspective. Your every fourth grader is ready for that. They talk about government, they talk about community organizing, they talk about the origin of this country before fourth grade, but they really dive into it fourth, fifth, 
fifth grade. So they're ready for that information and they're ready to have that conversation, the hard ones with their, with their teachers. So it's important to tell the truth from the beginning so that we're not here at 30, 40, 50 years old wondering, why did I never learn this? Why has anyone ever taught me that? So we have to start that at the beginning. So this is my work. That presentation is the work that I use or that the presentation I do. Thanks. Um, John, it was just so incredibly powerful. And um, the one just curiosity around solidarity that I want to add as it relates to Asian American communities being solidarity with indigenous communities too is that I know because of the kind of more prominent stop Asian hate conversation going on right now and obviously last month there was some news around Illinois being the first state to pass this TEACH Act which is teaching equitable Asian American history it's the first bill at a state level that introduced sort of um, requires public schools to teach a unit of Asian American history and I'm just thinking about how powerful it would be to elevate those conversations but in conjunction with other communities as well like it's not just about celebrating yay we're teaching Asian American history right but really for us in our consciousness to understand like like there it is not all states that have mandated um history for all types of communities right indigenous communities asian american communities black communities etc and so um just really really excited and thankful that you came to share your presentation with us yeah and and to talk to that too um it is important to share the story of of the true story of America history and how everyone contributed to this conversation. Everybody has contributed to the history. And, and I also, I, I know that I challenge the patriotism that exists in America today. And I challenge the historical aspect of what people hold on to as being the, the true history of the US, but we all do as, as persons of color. So this is a, a unpopular line that I use quite often, and it's to envelop everyone. If you consider yourself American, how do you exclude me from, from your history? And how do I call myself American if I'm excluded from your history? So that's a two-way street, right? It's not, and we have to do this work together, cohesively, and it just makes us so much stronger. Just like we, like as tribal nations, we can't just stand as one, we have to stand collectively. So just as we were trying to um, look at this, the racial disparities and look at these conversations, we also have to band together and do this work together to have a collective history that is true, that is honest, that our kids are proud of, that our ancestors are proud of. So I get asked that a lot too, like, how do you continue to do this work? I'm just trying to make my grandma proud. I hope that I hope that she looks down on me and is is proud of me because that's that's what this is about. It's about upholding who we are and knowing that I'm making that that difference in my community for everyone. We all have something to to gain from this, and it's beautiful on the other side. So let's just let's keep pushing to get on the other side, all of us together. Thank you so much, Donna, for being here with us today, sharing about your story, your experience, and also giving us a little bit of a history lesson, like yeah. the fourth graders <laughs> that we all are inside. Um, there's been a couple of requests for the slides. Um, if you're able to share them with us, we can send them around to the whole group afterwards, along with the recording from the webinar for those who couldn't be here. Um, and for everybody on the call, uh, like each had mentioned earlier, this is just the first of uh, several webinars that we'll be doing as Lunar Project. We have another one coming up on August 18th, which will be about a campaign called the Grassroots Reparations Campaign. Um, and so we will share more information about that with you all. Um, thank you all for being here. Have a great night. Um, Donna, is it okay if we share your contact info with the group too, if folks want to reach out? Yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. And I know like the one-on-one -on -one feels better. So please feel free. Um, there isn't a question that's, that's dumb or, or anything. I'm, I'm, that's from my mom. My mom used to say that all the time. So please feel free to ask me anything. Um, I recognize that I'm, a, I'm not 
the same as the rest of maybe my other indigenous partners in this work, but I do make myself available to those questions. I want to be a resource that you might not normally have. So please feel free to ask me at any time. And if I don't have an answer for you, I'll work hard to find one. We so appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good night, everyone. We will see Thank you, you soon. With us, Donna. Thank you, Donna. You're welcome Thank so you. much. Bye.